I don't think it's either or. Um, I would probably lean towards hire someone with functional expertise in growth and product management versus someone that has industry expertise. Maybe the only reason you might hire for industry expertise is if you are a regulated industry or a very, very specific niche compliance-based industry that you need those kind of pieces of knowledge for. But generally speaking, I think growth strategies and growth skills are fungible. Hello, we're Global App Testing, and this is Building Globally Lessons in Enterprise Product Growth. This is the fastest growing, most exciting podcast in product, and we will be looking at every single angle on how you can grow your enterprise product by talking to professionals in some extremely exciting businesses. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Building Globally Lessons in Enterprise Product Growth, brought to you by Global App Testing. I'm your host, Adam, and today we are delving into the world of B2B product growth strategies with a special guest, Shazad Sheikh. Shazad currently leads the product management for growth, mobile, and customer engagement teams at Asana, where he is a key figure on the R&D leadership team overseeing 15 product managers, over 150 cross-functional team members on 12 product teams. His role at Asana follows his work as the product management lead for growth at Meta, where he spearheaded several product-led growth initiatives across Meta Business Suite. Welcome, Shazad. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for having me. So I guess um, I would imagine that most people listening have heard of Asana, uh, but this goes out globally. So just for anybody who uh, hasn't heard of it, in your own words, what is Asana? Who is it for? What is it? What, how do you see its, its function as being? So Asana is really solving the problem or answering the question of what work is being done by who and by when. So really, we are a leading enterprise collaborative work management solution that is relevant across industries, across sectors, and trying to make sure that we're connecting a company's mission to their goals, to maybe portfolios of work that they're doing, to the projects, to the tasks. So really, if you think about Facebook's social graph, we are building what's called the work graph. So all of the modules necessary to track the work that you're doing, as you can imagine, it's massive and it's a massive need across the board. So I encourage everyone to go check out Asana, asana.com, and always reach out to me if you have questions. So uh, we're talking about a team of two people up to an enterprise organization. Is there, is there where, Where's the sort of the emphasis in terms of Asana's sweet spot, if there is one? That's a great question. You're absolutely right that we serve teams of one teams of 10, but our sweet spot is really serving these large, complex enterprise organizations. And as a proof point, our largest deployment is over 200,000 seats at a leading organization across the world. So we serve everyone, but our sweet spot is certainly the complex enterprise organizations that need that clarity and tracking of work. That's like a small city. And you uh, work in the growth pillar of Asana. So uh, just give us a sense of your place within the Asana machine. How, how's the growth pillar set up? And how is it different than traditional uh, product growth teams? Yes. So I do lead growth, which is an awesome privilege to do. Uh, we're set up in a way that's a bit unorthodox than what you would imagine a traditional growth team is. We certainly have the standard product-led growth, all the work that we do so that we can drive activation, the depth, breadth, and frequency of engagement, retention inside of Asana, prevent churn, drive expansion, so everything that you would think when it, you consider standard growth loops or viral growth or stickiness of a product, that falls inside the growth pillar. We also have components of our core, core product that sit inside of growth. So that is the end-to-end -end mobile solution in all of our mobile offerings. And that includes the infrastructure, core experience, and growth of mobile. Similar for our native desktop app. All of the work that we're doing related to search, navigation, and wayfinding across Asana and everything related to communication. So all of the user communication you see inside of the app, outside of the app via email, push notifications on third-party solutions like maybe Slack or Microsoft Teams. So growth is this large, all-encompassing pillar of sorts that spans platform, core product, and growth across the board. So it's been an awesome experience for me to really drive in with growth and kind of my bread and butter and what I've loved doing but also learn about core product and lead folks that are experts at that. So that's, that's kind of how we're set up. And it's a little bit different than what you would consider growth. I, I, I kid that we should maybe change the name of the pillar because we do so many different things, but we're still called growth today. 
Yeah, it, I mean, it sounds a little bit like you just described a sort of a, a large product management team across uh, all of the different things. What, what what is the advantage of describing that as a as a growth team? Why why is it framed in the way that it is? One is inertia, right? Like we've been called growth, so we kind of just continue that. But the second one is is an important situation when you think about growth. Growth is really the distribution of existing value, right? So you build a valuable feature that customers think are is valuable and they're willing to pay for it. And then a growth team kind of comes in horizontally and makes sure that that value is distributed through discoverability or enhancing the way that something works or making sure folks are getting in the right funnels at the right time. So really combining those two is, is no different than what you would consider standard growth, right? So I think folks that are tried and true experts at growth should be tried and true experts at not only the distribution of value, but creation of that value and vice versa. Folks that can create value should be experts at distributing that value. So We've kind of taken that literally and make sure that our teams are not only building zero to one valuable features for our customers, but are also experts at making sure that distribution happens. So I think it's a combination of it's kind of been that way. So we continued that. But more importantly, like we have this fundamental belief that value creation and value distribution should be sitting right next to each other. And uh, can you give me a sense of, because we obviously sort of set up to, to have this conversation, which is about product growth specifically. I wonder if you could give us a kind of quick snapshot of what current initiatives, what you think is important to growth at Asana right now? What is it that is driving growth in Asana? Where is it? I mean, you it sounds like you wear a lot of hats beyond growth, but if you're wearing your growth hat, where would you put your emphasis and your focus for kind of maximum outcome? Give us a sort of a flavor of the, the strategic land, growth landscape for Asana. I think there are three things that are most important to me today as I think about growth of the product and therefore growth of the business. The first one is how fast we can deliver value and how fast we can get customers to that aha moment so that they realize Asana is the tool and the solution for me. So that's everything from the early onboarding experience to user education, to really learning and orienting yourself in the product. And a lot of that, we're thinking about how we can supercharge with AI, right? Even though that feels like a buzzword or a hype across the industry, the truth is this is a wave of innovation that can really accelerate time to value. And we're taking advantage of that. The second one is retention. And that sounds like a standard thing we should be thinking about, but it is so important across the board because not only do we want to deliver value immediately and as fast as possible, we want to make sure that value is maintained throughout. So retention for me, be it making Asana a habit or making Asana a key part of the enterprise tech stack is something that's really important to me and the entire team. And the third one is what does growth mean as we move up market and serve enterprise customers? And what I mean by that specifically is that enterprise customers are different in their growth in the sense that they want more control. They want more visibility and understanding of what's happening. So the playbook that might be written is, hey, drive viral growth and make sure people are inviting all of their teammates and spreading across the organization. But you go to the IT admin or the buyer and they're not happy with that because they don't have control over their budgets. So we're really trying to think about how we deliver value to users, how we grow our user base, but at the same time, how we're partnering strategically with the folks that are buying the software and making the decisions so that they have control over their budgets, they have control over their deployments. So really the difference of learning and understanding how to expand within these enterprise customers and drive that enterprise growth is also something that's top of mind for me. You work at Asana presently. You used to work at Meta, also in a kind of growth-focused role. And one of the, I think, struggles um, sometimes when we talk to people who are focused on growth in product is that products are often very specific and that therefore you can get right into the weeds of individual user problems and the individual demands, therefore, that that has on a specific product in a specific context. I wanted to kind of get a sense of how fungible product growth strategies are, how, how far they can be transferred. And with your permission, I'd love to do that by basically comparing some of the ways that you've thought about growth at Asana with in your previous role was, was, was Meta. So could you just give us a, a kind of sense of how the role was different, how the strategy was different? If you're sat, if you're a product manager and you're sat down in front of the CEO and the CEO says, right, we need to grow the product. How is that different for a business in Meta versus Asana and, and crucially, how is it the same? What are the similarities between those two? 
I'll talk about the similarities first. And for context, when I was at Meta, I worked on a B2B solution for ads, right? But also outbound marketing, both organic and paid. So the solution I worked on was called Meta Business Suite, which was essentially kind of a central place or central solution where small and medium businesses could come and do all of their outbound marketing. So posting, uh, be it stories or photos to their feed, um, advertising, messaging, transactions, commerce, so everything in one place across Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. So really it was serving businesses. So there is some similarity in the sense that when you're serving businesses, there is a little bit of a difference on B2B versus B2C. But more importantly, the similarity is that if you think about it, B2B has become so consumerized that even at work, when you use software, you expect it to be a delightful user experience. You expect there to be a little bit of emotion in the product. You also think that, hey, there should be a profile picture, maybe an avatar, maybe a feed. So when you're at work using software, you're not interested in the clunky software that was created 15 or 20 years ago. You want that software to feel like what's on your phone today, like Instagram or TikTok or some consumer app that you use every day. So the similarities are as such that irrespective of if I was working at Meta or Asana, my end user is the same. It's a person at the other side that wants value and delight from that product. So there was that, but I think there are differences, right? So when I was at Meta, the business model was essentially all products drive engagement, which ideally lead to, for businesses at least, incremental advertising revenue. So it wasn't a subscription product, right? There wasn't necessarily a, if you're not getting continuous value from it, you're going to churn you probably still stay on the product because there's an organic component to it. You still will probably post to your feed. You probably will still create stories. And eventually we could monetize you and ask you to create ads, thereby generating incremental advertising revenue. At Asana, it's a little bit different, right? Like we are a subscription-based business. We sell seats and we have to work hard to maintain and retain those seats. So the business model and the approach is different. We have to deliver value continuously and in a different way. I think the other thing is the level of scale that you're working on. And I alluded to this in my previous answer around working in the enterprise. At Meta, the scale that I was working on was 90 to 100 million monthly active businesses. So the tactics were a little different. I could experiment very quickly and my teams could get statistically significant results from an A-B test within a day or two. And then we made decisions based on that. At Asana, it's different. Our user base is not that large, right? And that's by design. We are an enterprise B2B SaaS company. So we have a smaller user base, right? So the X million users that we are working with, you can't always get statistically significant results in an experiment that fast. And importantly, you can't always experiment, right? If you go to big company X and say, I'm running an AB test, half of your employees are going to see one experience and the other half is going to see another. I can guarantee that that customer would say, absolutely not. I don't want to have that, especially when you're mission critical software. So I think there are certain similarities in the way that you build and the value that you deliver. But the business model and the scale is different. So you have to adjust your growth strategy to be able to take that into account. Obviously, product is not the only department that is tasked with uh, growth uh, in, a, in a business. There's marketing, there's sales. I wonder how, the, how it changes the two different kinds of business that we're talking about, how your relationship with those department changes in, in terms of identifying a, a strategy for growth for the company together. I think the relationship it was always there, right? At Meta, I had pretty close contact with all of our folks on the go-to-market side, from marketing to sales. But at Asana, I would say it's 10x, right? And one is because of size of company. But more importantly, again, the distribution and the business model is as such that in a B2B enterprise SaaS environment, go-to-market and products should be joint at the hip. So the leaders across marketing and sales and customer support they're all working with leaders across R&D because we need to not only build value, we need to distribute that value, but we also need to be able to tell that story and maintain that story across the board and be in lockstep when we do it. So certainly my relationship with go-to-market is a lot deeper and I have so, so much respect for the folks that are doing that work and they make me better every single day. It was the same at Meta, but, but you have a good point. Like that relationship is so much deeper at Asana because it's almost required that we're in lockstep. Whereas again, at Meta, it was a little different. Like we certainly did go to market activation and marketing, but we were a broadly distributed organic tool. So you could kind of organically discover us, right? You knew the Meta brand, you knew the three or four key products that you would use for advertising. So it's not like we were doing a bunch of brand awareness or activation work. Whereas at Asana, 
we do have to do that. We have to maintain our brand and awareness in the market. So it's important that we work closely with the go-to-market team. And more importantly, we tell that corporate narrative across the board. Do you think it impacts the kind of character of a piece of software if there is a deeper engagement with the go-to-market teams? I would say that there's some some product managers would don't like to you know take instructions from marketing or sales people because in their heart they believe that you should truly drive growth by just delivering value to customers and that all of this you know trying to answer questions of more users with the marketing team is misguided all you really should do is is make the best product possible and i wonder when you are working with um marketing or sales or or or, or business functions that are explicitly just focused on new business and that's it I wonder how that changes the product, how you as a product manager put in guardrails to make sure that the, you know, the commercial teams that are maybe more short term in their focus don't make short term decisions that impact the product, how you understand that as a kind of problem and, and, and manage it. Well, you said something that's probably the crux of this all, right, is build the best product possible and building the best product possible if you distill the equation down It's listen to your users, know what they want, build it, distribute it to them and do that on repeat. So that flywheel keeps continuing. Now, the first part, listen to your users, I think comes from everywhere, right? So the commercial teams that are working on go to market, be it marketing or sales, these folks are with customers every single day. Now, so is R&D, right? So we are spending our time talking to users, talking to customers, so we understand their needs But so is marketing, right? Marketing is out telling our corporate narrative, making sure that customers are hearing what we want to say, and then also getting feedback from them, right? Through it, be it through corporate events or just conversations they're having with other leaders and sales specifically, they are spending time with customers every single day to understand their needs, to understand maybe where they're not happy, to close new deals. All of that is extremely valuable feedback that comes back to R&D voice of the customer, the voice of the business. And we use that as inputs to build an even better product. So for me, that flywheel keeps spinning of listen to your users, build what they want, distribute that back to them, make them happy and repeat. That actually is supercharged when the go-to-market and commercial teams are involved because there is no such thing as too much user input. So all the input coming from all of these teams is only beneficial to you. So certainly I think Yes, there are guardrails that you want to put in place to avoid short-term thinking, which for what it's worth could happen in R&D, could happen on go-to-market. But more importantly and more beneficial is when the entire group of folks, irrespective of function, is really pulling that customer feedback and put, giving it back to you so you could deliver the most valuable thing to the market and retain and grow your customer base. But do you think that the new business departments, marketing and sales, do you think that the way that they listen to customers is different from the way that a product team listens to customers? Do you think that the character of customer information, which, you know, we try and understand customers as deeply as possible, but is refracted through the framework of a marketing or a salesperson versus a product person? Do you think that is that there is a difference there? I think so. I mean, I think the one thing that you have to be sure to avoid is this kind of enterprise innovation trap, which is, hey, I'm trying to close this one customer. They want these three features. Make sure that it happens for me. Whether or not it scales to other customers doesn't matter, but I certainly want this in the product so I can close this deal. Of course that happens, right? We serve big customers and they have needs that are maybe more specific than other customers. Those are decisions that we have to make, right? We are building a business, we're growing a business. And sometimes we say yes to those things. Sometimes we say no but you have to be principled about it. So yeah, I think there is certainly things you have to watch out for, enterprise innovation trap being one of them. So there is probably like that short-term versus long-term versus what's specific and what scales that you have to notice. Uh, but I would actually go out on a limb and say, that's not just go to market teams, right? When we talk to customers, R&D is equally incentivized to make sure that deals are closing and the business is doing better. So sometimes even we will push to say, hey, we'll build this custom piece of software to make this customer happy, which again, is not a bad thing, but it's just something you have to make calculated decisions on. So I think the answer to your question, I'll answer like a product manager is it depends. It's a yes and no answer. Imagine if I were a a head of product and I was hiring a head of product growth. One of the, I guess the themes has been fungibility. If somebody is hiring a, a director of product growth, do you think there's always off, there's always a trade-off between like 
in industry expertise versus expertise in the kind of role. And I wonder um, where you would put the emphasis if you were in that. Is it is it better to hire somebody who knows a lot about the specific problems that you have in your specific industry? Or is it that product management skills are kind of broadly applicable and that you could you should hire the best possible product manager from a completely different industry? I don't think it's either or. Um, I would probably lean towards hire someone with functional expertise in growth and product management versus someone that has industry expertise. Maybe the only reason you might hire for industry expertise is if you are a regulated industry or a very, very specific niche compliance-based industry that you need those kind of pieces of knowledge for. But generally speaking, I think growth strategies and growth skills are fungible. And it goes back to my earlier point that whether you've done B2C or B2B, it's kind of the same now, right? B2B has a lot of consumer flavor in it. And the growth is very similar and how you drive growth and that bottoms up adoption across an employee base in B2B is very similar to how you would drive viral growth for any sort of consumer app. There's a little bit of nuance when it comes to enterprise growth, kind of like I mentioned earlier, that maybe folks want to understand when they're hiring their first head of product growth. But I think the tactics, the strategies and the direction stay the same. What I would say is really important bringing on a growth leader or evaluate, evaluating someone that is going to be responsible for product growth is that growth is addicting when you see numbers go up and to the right. And when you see green on experiment results and you want to ship, ship, ship and go, go, go. And that's awesome. And you should do that. But I always say that growth and quality are not zero sum. So the user experience, the long-term compounding effects of the work that you do in experiment and the small optimizations that you're shipping, those things will have an effect on your brand, on your brand, and those will have an effect on how people perceive your company and your product. So today you might see short-term gains in certain metrics, but tomorrow that actually might be degrading your brand because you might be growth hacking. So I would say that's one really important thing that at least I dig into for growth leaders that I hire or folks that I am coaching on growth is that growth product quality are certainly not zero sum. You can do both. You can deliver a delightful user experience that's amazingly valuable, but also grow your product from a metrics and business perspective. So doing both is really important. And, and just to sort of spell that out. So everybody wants to grow their product. There's a risk there that actually by taking rapid product actions, you're going to create quality issues that are going to alienate groups of, you, of users in the, in the long term. How do you protect against that at Asana? We have guardrails in place. I think from a metrics perspective, certainly. Like if we are building something that wants to drive up activation, we don't want to fill the funnel with you know folks that are going to be short-term retained and then drop off later. So I think from a quantitative perspective, we have guardrails. More importantly, we have a set of design principles that prevents any sort of deception or dark patterns across our products so that we could maintain our brand value and the value we deliver to customers. And I think it's also an ingrained thing across our product leadership team that we are optimizing and building for the long term. And we have our customers in mind always. So any short term gains today are not necessarily going to be those that are sustained. And we look at experiences consistently to see if they're still meeting our quality bar. And I think our friends in product design, our friends in data science, across the board in R&D, we have a shared understanding of what it means to have high quality product, what it means to ship high quality product. And then at the same time, what is required of us in terms of product and business growth and we're effectively playing guardrail and balancing act with checks and balances with each other as we build and ship. So I think there is no perfect science in any company. And at certain times you will make a mistake and maybe ship something that wasn't as valuable, but drove short term growth or maybe not ship something that could have driven long term growth. But you were hesitant because you were concerned about it affecting product quality. But you make the calls. You learn from the outcomes and then you iterate. And I think we're very good at doing that at Asana. And it's been a pleasure to see that. And more importantly, it's been a pleasure to kind of learn that from a lot of leaders at Asana. Just sort of staying on, on teams and functions, is there any advice, general advice that you would give about building a product growth team? Like anything beyond how to hire that first manager that you have noticed or that you've learned in the years you've spent in this uh, industry that you think is important to get right? I think I'll preface with say, saying that 
any of the stuff I say is probably not just limited to growth leaders or hiring product managers for growth, but they certainly are very important when you're talking about building a growth team. The first one is applicable to all PMs, but very specifically to growth is that bringing clarity to ambiguity. You don't always know the problem that you're trying to solve. And maybe it's just, you know, X metric is down or we're not doing so great on retention. A leader or a very senior product manager should be able to take that and go figure out the exact problem that's trying to be solved, potential solutions, trade-offs, and how we're going to approach execution. So certainly that skill is extremely important. The second thing I would say is fluency in data. And again, that sounds very cliche, but the importance of it is, is a lot, right? So you have to really focus on how can you take quantitative measures and the right ones that are a proxy to customer value and user value, and then optimize for those, for the right ones to go up and the right ones to go down. And importantly, maybe calling out some that are not actually a proxy to customer value. So maybe you're measuring a metric that doesn't actually do anything and it's a vanity metric. And having the knowledge and being able to call that out is important. The third, I would say, is something I mentioned previously that I feel very passionate about is that there is no such thing as a growth product manager. I think it's a product manager that's really good at driving distribution and growth. But that product manager is a product manager first and foremost, which means they understand the value they want to deliver to a user and a customer. They are the advocates of that user or customer, and then they build that value and then they distribute that value. And maybe they're an expert at the distribution of that value, but certainly they should first and foremost be an expert at building that value. So that summarized means that a core product product manager versus a growth product manager, I actually don't think those two things exist. That distinction is not real in my head. I think it's you are a product manager and today you are working on growth and that's okay to do. Tomorrow you might be working on core product. So those are, I'd say three things that are principles that I keep in mind as I build a growth team or bring on growth leaders. I've got um, a bit of a kind of horrible interview question in front of me. And I will say that I actually stole this from a, a Lenny Dreycheski, an article where they, he was asking heads of products their favorite interview question. So it is literally an interview question. The question is, if you were coming in to a business as a head of product, what would you actually need to know to calibrate the growth strategy correctly? What would be the things that you think would be attributes of the product that would, would be important to helping you identify what would be the most suitable way to grow that product? I think digging in, there's a few fundamental questions that I think are very obvious to understand. Like what space are we playing in? Who is our target customer? What does our traditional growth look like, right? Is it through product-led growth? Is it through sales-led growth? Is it through a combination of product-led sales? It's really understanding what go-to-market motion has worked or what go-to-market motion that we are looking to start optimizing and going in that direction. And then beyond that, I would really want to dig into the learnings of the past. And maybe I'm spoiled in the sense that we did this at Meta and we've done it at Asana in the sense that any experiment that we run, the hypothesis that we look to validate or invalidate, we do a rigorous process of documenting those learnings, be it three, four or five years later, you can go back and see what has worked and what has not worked in the product. So I really want to kind of dig in and understand like, what have we done in the past and what has been successful? Not taking that as Bible to say like, those are the things that are going to work in the future, because of course, user bases start to mix shift, things change, but just understanding a little bit of the learnings from the past. And then from there being very crystal clear on what our North star is, right? Is our North star incremental ARR? Is our North Star some level of engagement that we want to get to? Is it to get some sort of penetration in X industry or X market? So understanding kind of the direction that we want to go and then working backwards from there, right? So if our North Star from a growth perspective is, hey, we want to be a very, very engaging product and thereby drive retention so that we can drive, you know, net dollar retention or net seat expansion is positive. In that case, I'm going to work backwards to understand all of the levers that need to be pulled in the product to make that a reality. Fantastic. Um, final question uh, that we ask all our interviews. If you could take one person in product out for lunch, uh, who would that be? And could you also tell me, could, do you describe the kind of lunch that you would like to have with them? What kind of restaurant you would want to take them to? Or maybe you would cook for them at home, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the person that immediately comes to mind is Nikhil Singhal. Um, I don't know him personally. He is the founder of, of the Skip community or a Skip podcast that I listen to religiously. It's about kind of product career or becoming a good product executive. 
Uh, I'm a huge fanboy of Nikhil. So I, I would absolutely be thrilled to take him out to lunch and be able to kind of have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him for what it's worth. I consider him a career advisor, even though he doesn't know me. I listen to his podcast and essentially, you know, he's like, it's my career coach. Uh, so he's obviously done an amazing job at distributing content. I take Nikhil out for lunch. Uh, the type of food, I'm pretty selfish. I love burgers. So I'd probably sit and have a burger with Nikhil. Um, but I'm okay with if he wants to go somewhere else, as long as I get to spend some time with him. So it's probably, it'd probably be Nikhil Singh Hall. So if, if Nikhil, Nikhil's listening, my inbox is open for a lunch date anytime. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us and enjoy. Uh, we have a long weekend here. Do you have a long weekend where you are? We no. do. And I'm, I'm actually taking the week off to go to Hawaii with the family. So this is a perfect time to tell me to enjoy. I'm excited. Oh, fantastic. That sounds amazing. I've never been to Hawaii. I would love to go. Um, yeah, have, have a great time in Hawaii. And I'll speak thank to you, you very all. soon. Yeah, thanks so much. Building Globally was brought to you by Global App Testing. To find out more about how best-in-class functional and UX testing can help your product grow, head to globalapptesting.com. If you enjoyed what you just heard, click follow on the platform you're using right now. Building Globally is available anywhere you get your podcasts.